Hello, everyone, and welcome. Thanks for joining today's conversation with historian Elizabeth D. Leonard, author of the recent biography, Benjamin Franklin Butler, A Noisy, Fearless Life. The program is part of the Made at the Library event series, which highlights works inspired by and emerging from research at the Library of Congress. Featuring authors, artists, and other creators in conversation with library experts, this series takes a deep dive into the process of working with the library's collections. My name is Bruce Kirby, and I'm a reference librarian in the Manuscript Division. I'm one of the panelists today. The other panelist is my colleague, Dr. Michelle Crow. She's going to now tell us a little bit more about today's author. Thanks, Bruce. As Bruce mentioned, I'm Michelle Crow, the Civil War and Reconstruction Specialist in the Manuscript Division and the curator of the Benjamin F. Butler Papers. And it is my pleasure to introduce today's featured author, Elizabeth Leonard. Elizabeth D. Leonard is the John J. and Cornelia V. Gibson Professor of History Emerita at Colby College in Waterville, Maine. Leonard is the author of several books on the Civil War era, including Yankee Women, Gender Battles in the Civil War, All the Daring of the Soldier, Women of the Civil War Armies, and Lincoln's Forgotten Ally, Judge Advocate General Joseph Holt of Kentucky, which was named the co-winner of the Gilder Lehrman Lincoln Prize in 2012. In her new book, Benjamin Franklin Butler, A Noisy, Fearless Life, Elizabeth delves into the life of the controversial 19th century lawyer, Civil War general, and Massachusetts politician, and argues for a reevaluation of the historical reputation of this Colby College alumni and Democrat turned radical Republican. Given that today's conversation is part of the Made at the Library series, it would be remiss of me not to note that Elizabeth is one of, if not the only, researcher to identify her favorite manuscript reading room locker number in her book acknowledgments. <laughs> Welcome to the program, Elizabeth. Thank you. It's such a pleasure to be here. So before we begin the conversation about the book, would you take a few minutes to introduce our audience to Benjamin Butler and your book? Sure. Uh, Benjamin Butler was, as you said, a lawyer. He was also a businessman. He was a Civil War general. He was a Colby College alumnus, although it was Waterville College at the time. He was a congressman from Massachusetts to the United States Congress. He was a presidential uh, wannabe and, and also ran. Um, he was governor of Massachusetts. He was many, many things. Uh, he's a fascinating figure and uh, very much deserves uh, a closer examination, I would say. The book is an attempt to offer that kind of closer examination. I myself have been familiar with Butler as long as I've been a Civil War historian. He just crops up everywhere. And as I've told a number of people, I often think of him as Butler Gump or Forrest Butler, or I mean, he just pops up everywhere. But um, I didn't really pay a lot of close attention to him, even though he kept popping up. Um, because I was focused on other things, but his connection to Colby College and my connection and for many other reasons, I finally decided this is the book um, to write. And I think it does give a good reevaluation of him that focuses that, or that examines his entire life, which was 70 some years long, uh, as opposed to just looking at his Civil War years, which is where most of the focus has been given in the past. Uh, I hope it's fair and balanced. I brought all my historical historian skills to bear uh, as, as best I could. Um, I hope it's readable and I hope people will read it. Well, great, thank you so much. So let's delve uh, a little deeper into a few aspects of Butler's life and legacy. So history tends to remember Butler in caricature. He was Beast Butler, who insulted white Southern women in New Orleans <clears throat> and stole spoons. He was caricatured as an opportunist who changed his political affiliations every time the wind blew a different direction. <laughs> so, <laughs> and, it, and it blew quite a bit. <laughs> it's so true. <laughs> so our, my question to you is, or kind of two questions is, are these unfair characterizations or unfair caricatures? And if so, why do they persist so long? I do think they are unfair uh, characterizations of him. I think they distill the life and work of a fascinating figure who contributed enormously to the nation's history 
and particularly to our struggle for social, racial, and economic justice uh, during the 19th century, they distill that down to uh, a kind of ugly, um, distorted, well, I guess all caricatures are distorted, an ugly sort of remnant of who he was based on things that people who hated him um, dis thought were most important about him, the reasons why they hated him. I think that, uh, and, and a lot of that derives from his Civil War career. There are bits and pieces of his pre-war career that, and his interactions with some um, leading figures in Massachusetts that contribute to that. But I also think it's to a great extent the responsibility of not just lost cause apologists in the post-war period, but the, I won't say unwitting allies, but the unconfessed allies of the lost cause apologists across the country that have perpetuated that myth. And I think, or those, those that caricature, I think that, um, yeah, I think that it's not just neo-Confederates that have stained his, stained his reputation or perpetuated this caricature. I think there are many other people who've been involved as well for a variety of reasons, mm -hmm. mostly because he ticked off a lot of people and this is their <laughs> revenge. Well, and, and since the, pe the people who are left are the ones who write the story, that, that probably That's contributed right. quite a bit to it. So Butler was a political general during the Civil War, one of many who were given command, not necessarily for any military experience, but rather to help the Union Army and the Lincoln administration solidify political support or the loyalty of specific groups of Americans. So why was Butler given command and how do you rate him as a field commander? Well, I would want to say that it, he was not lacking in military experience. He certainly was not uh, a part of the regular army to his certain dismay. I mean, he had wanted to go to West Point. Uh, he didn't get to go to West Point. He ended up at Waterville College instead. But he was a leading figure in the Massachusetts volunteer militia at the time that the war was looming. Uh, and he had, so he had some military experience at that level. He also um, was a businessman well-connected in his town uh, and a lawyer, and he was a wily fellow and he was an ambitious fellow. And, and the combination of those factors, genuinely uh, important ways that he could help uh, Massachusetts and the nation uh, address this looming cataclysm, <laughs> um, Though that contributed and his own ambition, of course, as well. And plus being a Democrat. I mean, you mentioned the idea of, of solidifying political support. I think Lincoln was uh, concerned that the war should not come across as a war of Republicans against Democrats or Republicans against everybody else. Uh, so the war Democrats were, or the Democrats who were in support of the union cause were very important to him. And, and Butler was a leading figure within the Democratic Party, at least in the North. So, uh, and he was willing, and he was an uncompromising unionist, you know, despite having voted for Jefferson Davis <laughs> in Charleston in 1860, which I happen to remember. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> But another another caricature, perhaps, or a stereotype of, of Butler is that he was a terrible commander in the oh, yes. field, you know, Dutch Gap Canal and some of the other things that were yes. going on. So how do you rate him in terms of his actual military experience? I would first I want to say that I'm not a military historian per se. Uh, so in general, I will defer to the military historians, and I think they're probably right. Uh, in terms of his his failures um, at Big Bethel, at Fort Fisher, et cetera, uh, Bermuda 100. I, it, there's no question to me that um, his administrative skills far exceeded his field command skills, and they, but they were extremely good. I mean, he really was an excellent administrator, which is probably a key reason why Lincoln, one of the reasons why Lincoln kept him on. Um, but I still, again, without being a military historian myself, I do encourage people, and I hope the book does too, to think of Butler's failures as a field commander in, in a larger context, which is to say, why do we remember 
his failures and forget his successes. For example, in Baltimore, in Annapolis, at Cape Hatteras, and so on. Why do we say things are failures when they could be looked at in a different way? For example, Fort Fisher, certainly he was not able to take Fort Fisher, but he also did save a lot of, he spared his soldiers a great deal of bloodshed by backing off there. And when Fort Fisher was taken, it was taken with tremendous bloodshed. So if you asked his soldiers, they might have a different view of whether it was a failure or a success. And the, and the last thing I'll say on that front is, why do we um, emphasize his failures in field command so heavily, but not, but seem to forget the failures of other generals? You know, you know, so there's something about Butler that seems to be, it's like he's a magnet or has been turned into a magnet for, let's just remember all the bad things. Like he voted for Jefferson Day, you know, those things, people remind me of those things all the time. And I could give a list, a long list of his accomplishments and someone will come to me and say, yes, but you know, he did vote for Jefferson Davis in Charleston in 1860. <laughs> and I think, okay, he also pushed through the KKK Act in 1871. So which one, you know, really can we wait yeah, those in, in the balance, what's the sheet? balance here? what's the balance <laughs> that you're working with yeah well and you when you and i had talked before i thought that it was such a striking point about people so so focus on butler's military failures but yet there are so many other generals military experience and otherwise who 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 did not succeed on right. many occasions right. and their reputations aren't aren't dominated by by that those right. events. other successes managed to shove the the failures or the weaknesses to the side and with him there's so much glee i mean there's really genuine glee if people sort of i i can go on and on about the things and yeah but he was the beast you know and mm -hmm. i think oh, that's so interesting and this sort of delight in uh, going back to that clown like image right. of him which is it's interesting to me all right, so we'll move to something that's a little bit less clown-like, and we'll actually have we will have a good visual of him as opposed to to the the first two. So you include an entire chapter on Butler's time in New Orleans in your book, and so why is New Orleans so important in Butler's story and to your interpretation of Butler's history? It's New Orleans is very important in his story because it's such an important moment in the history of the war. And it's such a huge assignment. I mean, here he is now in command of the occupation forces in much of 1862 um, in New Orleans, this very diverse, very complicated, very commercial, uh, racially complex city, internationally complex city, and really the one of the first major places for the Union Army to land and take control. And he has a really hard job to do. And how he manages that job, which is in some ways the onset of Reconstruction. I mean, we think of Reconstruction often as starting after the war is over, but it starts as soon as Union forces are in place, right? How are we going to bring this occupied portion of the Confederacy back into the into the fold? Um, it's an enormous job he has to do. So there's there's a it's just a very interesting, complex story with a lot of weight to it. In terms of Butler's own story and legacy or the, the way Butler's been seen, it's also the place where so much of this negativity about him is rooted in that how he functions in New Orleans and the things he's remembered for doing in New Orleans. So the execution of William Mumford for pulling the flag down from the mint, you know, and dragging it through the streets, the woman order that you, you know, the way that he says to the, the Confederate women, stop spitting on my soldiers or I'm throwing you in jail, essentially. Stop wearing their bones around your neck or I'm gonna throw you in jail. So a lot of the beast spoons uh, caricatures derive from uh, New Orleans and then are perpetuated afterwards. And I think it's interesting that if you look back to 1861, the middle of 1861, when he's been at Fort Monroe, he's held Maryland in the Union and, and so on. Many Americans believe that Benjamin Butler was the person who very quickly was going to save the Union. He was the general to turn to, he was the one who was gonna save the Union. 
after New Orleans, there's all of this other stuff that comes out about him and attitudes towards him. And that early war understanding of who he was and the role he would play vanishes from the historical memory. So one thing I was so struck by in your book and uh, is to, to the extent that Butler's wartime experiences so shaped his post-war life in terms of both political affiliations, but also his commitment to African-Americans afterwards. So can you give us a little sense of, of how important his wartime experiences were to who he became during and after the war? Yes. Um, one of the things I, I have said uh, in a number of places is that Butler understood himself to be a champion of the underdog. And I think he's telling the truth when he says that. But who he understood to be the nation's underdogs changed over time. And it was the war and his direct encounter with enslaved people at Fort Monroe and his work to begin that process of emancipation there. And then subsequently in New Orleans and then with the Army of the James, his work with black soldiers, not just to expand their enlistments, but to command them as well. And his experience of them as soldiers and of the freed people after the war in uh, their struggles for to make their freedom mean something, all of that just continues to transform him. But the war is absolutely central to his transformation. And it's because he, now encountered slavery in a very direct way, its implications, its horrors. Um, he had seen that in Lowell, he had seen what he understood to be the worst kind of human treatment was what, ha what experienced, was experienced by mill workers. That's what he experienced in his younger life. Um, once he sees slavery up close and personal, it, it transforms him and, it, and he never looks back. I mean, he just becomes a very consistent supporter of emancipation, black civil rights, black freedom, et cetera. And that, that's a nice segue into the question about his political affiliations, because that's another thing that he is often accused of is, is being, uh, you know, flipping so quickly between political party to political party what, in, in, in terms of his own opportunism instead. So the, my question for you would be, what is his political trajectory and to what extent did, did Butler remain somewhat consistent and then the parties changed around him? Right. I read an article not that long ago that described him. It was sort of a blog post, I guess, as opposed to a published article, but it was a, a post that said he was a political weirdo who had, <laughs> that was the word, who had no coherent <laughs> policies at all. And I, I thought, well, I don't think he'd mind being called a weirdo. He probably would just chuckle at that because he had a very good sense of humor. But he would absolutely deny that he had no political coherence, whatever. I, he, he said he was a, a champion of the underdog. He, he sought, he emblazoned it on his tombstone. Uh, he said many times during his life, everybody, every man, he said. But I think he would, uh, later in his life, had it been conventional to do so, he would have, in terms of language use, he would have said every man and woman has the right to achieve, you know, whatever they can achieve on the strength of their own power, they should have, he wanted to level the playing ground. And that was the principle that sort of guided him all his life, even as it, he became more expansive in who he understood to be needing support and needing help. Um, but the parties were not consistent. The parties values changed. And he really, although he was a very loyal Democrat up until uh, the war, I would say after that, he was just looking for wherever he thought the agenda that he had, whatever party would most closely support that. And by the end of his life, by the latter years of his life, certainly, he just didn't think any, any of the major parties were going to be able to do that. And, and he was not alone. His correspondence is full in those later years of Republicans and Democrats telling him to found a third party, you know, just, just dump them both, you know, because neither one of them cares about people. It, they care about money, they care about power, they care about, you know, um, banks, 
They care about industry. They don't care about workers. They don't care about blacks. They don't care about women. Uh, and, and he cared about those things. And it was hard for him to find a party home, but that's not incoherence. That's just a, a decision to hold on to your principles and say the parties just aren't doing the right thing. Right. Well, actually, your mention of his correspondence provides us a very good segue to let me turn the, the mic over to Bruce, who has some collection based questions for you in terms of your research and the Butler papers. So Bruce, take it away. Thanks, Michelle. <clears throat> Elizabeth, I wanted to talk about some of the other voices that crop up in his papers. I mean, obviously, his the large collection of um, the Butler papers here in the manuscript division are a great resource for telling the story of Butler's life and career and also giving you insights into his family. Um, but the other voices that come up, and in particular, there are uh, some harrowing accounts of racial violence in um, the Reconstruction period. There's a, a lady named Emma Hammock, who um, in 1874 wrote him a very alarming account of an attack she experienced. And um, I was wondering if if you think um, that this collection would be a resource for recent efforts to document racial violence, um, how easy would it be to pull out um, these letters about these um, attacks? Well, those are two separate questions <laughs> in the sense that it the collection absolutely is a resource for those uh, for finding evidence of racial violence in the Reconstruction period and after really straight up through his life. As long as we have Butler's papers, he's getting letters from um, people telling him what's going on, not just in the South, but all over the country. So it's a, it's a great untapped resource. And I think that is something that I brought to the biography that was new. Um, in the sense that I looked for that kind of stuff very actively. I decided, well, some of the, his previous biographers, they all focus on these same things. But once I started finding letters of that sort, of that nature dealing with that racial violence or racial relations, um, there were, I was captivated by them. How easy it is, is a different question. And uh, I, I, I hope someday that, um, it will get easier with possibly digitizing the collection, but currently it's not digitized. So it's a very, it's a matter of, you know, looking through the folders and looking for keywords in the letters that you find. And it is possible, and it's certainly possible enough that historians shouldn't shy away from doing it. You know, but it, it yeah. it's hard. You have to, you cannot be thinking, okay, I'm going to go down there for a week. I'm going to get a, a whole article out of this in, in a week's worth of research. You have to be willing to sit there and um, look for the evidence in the letters. But once you realize certain words, I think I mentioned to you earlier, if you, if you're just scanning a letter and you see the word colored, for me, that was a trigger. You know, it might not be valuable, but it almost always was somebody saying, I served in the United States colored troops as a soldier under your command and, you know, or my father was, you know, or it referenced something to do with um, blacks in the South. Or you look for words like violence, or you look for terms like the KKK, you know, things yeah. like that. So it can be found, but it's a matter of committing the time to uh, looking for it and deciding that's what I wanna find. I don't really need to tread over the same ground. Okay. Um, yeah, I, I looked at the uh, finding aid for the Butler papers and noticed um, the, the there's a massive uh, collection of general correspondence or a massive series of correspondence. And there are some 169 massive. boxes. And yeah. for the audience, With many benefit, folders in every box, many, yes, many folders, yes. and many letters in every folder. <laughs> yes, hundreds of pages in each box, right? <laughs> And that's similar to, um, if I can just throw in another work that um, you've published in recent years, the biography of Joseph Holt. Um, that's a similar uh, large correspondence series, some over 70, I think, volumes of chronologically arranged correspondence. And so you're something of a veteran dealing with these large Civil War era collections. And I was going to ask you about um, if you can, how do you approach or strategize, you know, your research in these collections. You kind of touched on it a moment ago with uh, 
your comments about looking for keywords, but any other yeah. tips for somebody who's thinking about coming down and looking at that? Well, I have several thoughts. One is that you got to love it to do it. And I love it, you know, um, and if you're going to do that kind of research, this is not just to butter you wonderful people up, but really the Library of Congress is a great place to do it. It's a wonderful facility. It's very comfortable. The research librarians are excellent and the materials come to you right away. And uh, you just have to love to sit there um, and, and do it. My approach, um, it has always been to kind of go from box one to box whatever, you know, I'm very linear in my, my thinking, but I will say that I got great advice. She didn't give it to me personally, but I, I heard her say this, Laurel Thatcher Ulrich, when she was working on Martha Ballard and these 30 years worth of diaries of Martha Ballard, she said, um, when you're starting to do this kind of research, it's like walking into a room full of people and you don't know who you need to know and who you don't need to know, you know? So you have to really sort of dive in, go in with as much knowledge as you can from other sources that are available, published sources, just so you know, like know the names of his family members, for yeah. goodness sake. So, yeah. but, go in as best you can with the, the knowledge you can bring so that you're not um, spending time looking at stuff that isn't important. But to some extent, you're going to have to backtrack. I mean, I, I learned that. You also, as you go through the collection, you realize, boy, he's got a lot of letters from this person, or he talks about this thing a great deal. Now I have to go back um, yeah. and, and check. And it, it becomes easier over time because you come to realize who are the important characters, who are maybe less important. You don't have to read absolutely every letter. But, you know, I probably went through, I don't think I skipped, you know, whole folders. I, you know, I went through each folder. And sometimes you think, you know, I got to get on the plane and you know, a couple hours, I'm going to have to move a little faster. But, you, you know, you have to take the time uh, and you have to just be willing to to do the work. And fortunately, it's work that I always loved to do. And I love to do it at the library. Yeah. Uh, and uh, to your point where you say it helps to know the names of people involved, oh, yeah. I mean, also uh, incidents that that they're discussing in the letters. I've are that's useful to know all this background and um, I've seen people with uh, databases of historic newspapers open on their laptop as they're going through they can cross reference you know articles right. from the time to what these people are discussing in their letters right absolutely yeah and you can figure out when something's out of place too which occasionally happens you think yeah. well that didn't happen then you know, and with a huge collection, it's unavoidable. You know, things get moved around. Somebody drops off. You know, this is our family cache of Butler letters. Here you are, you know, and, and suddenly things. Or in the case of Holt, I know that there were things that were, sadly, so much of the Holt material was glued into these books. Yeah. Unlike the Butler stuff is all loose in folders, as I recall, except for the, yes. the letter books. But the Holt stuff, then there were boxes of stuff where things were loose in the boxes. And they were not chronologically necessarily distinct. They were sort of like, well, I'm not sure I remember why things were in boxes that weren't in glued into the binders. But, you know, things, you just have to be prepared for things not always to be quite in order. So background knowledge is really useful. But you don't, you also need to be prepared to think, boy, what they said about what happened when, that's actually not true because I'm finding evidence that it didn't happen then. You know, it actually happened at this other time. So you have to be kind of flexible, have con it's like driving, you know, you have to have enough confidence to, you know, keep driving, but you have to be cautious enough to, to slow down when it's time to slow down. Yeah, interesting. And I, I know that the Holt papers and the Butler papers were both processed some time ago and uh, more, more modern finding aids are, we're, our preparation section is working hard to um, raise up topics like, um, you know, suffrage and civil rights and things like that. But in these older legacy collections, um, those terms might not appear in the finding aids. And um, so I was wondering if you encountered any challenges uh, presented by these these older finding aids and large sets of chronological correspondence, like the just the catalog terms and the descriptive terms. Would you add anything? 
Well, I think for me, the finding aid for in both cases was more to give me a chronological framework. And in that sense, I think they're very good or that the type of material it is, they're very good. And because I was writing biographies, I wanted to gobble everything. You know, I, I, mm -hmm. I wasn't looking specifically. If I went back and I thought, oh, I just want to look at stuff that he, you know, is on suffrage. Well, sure, it'd be great if that was in there. But for my purposes, that wasn't so important. But for somebody who's doing a narrow, more narrowly focused project, certainly more, you know, specific terms would be useful. I think it depends on what you're what you're going after. Okay. And um, also, I want to touch on um, another uh, sort of a less highlighted voice. Um, you said that um, the paper trail for Butler's valet, Albert West, um, was excruciatingly thin. Mm -hmm. And so I was wondering, did you any, have any particular strategies uh, to look for records on him? And can you offer any insights on people, you know, how to find uh, information on more ordinary people in the past? Well, I think as I was saying um, right before we got started, a name is so valuable. And it, you know, if you have a name, it's a doorway in. And the name West was an amazing doorway in for me because I knew I could look for that name and I found it. And I'm convinced I found it at least 95% of <laughs> The times it showed up in that collection because I looked so carefully and I was very alert to that. So having the name of somebody uh, is extremely useful or having a, a search term. I wish I could have found more about Albert West, but I found quite a bit. Um, and from the letters where he appeared or other documents where he appeared, I was able to cross reference to some a couple of newspaper articles where they you know, condescended to mention him at the time of Butler's funeral or, or whatever. But again, you know, I would say if you can go in with some solid, any, a hook that's very, you know, reliable like that, um, it, it's helpful. Otherwise, again, it's just, yeah, time, yeah. energy, and commitment to finding it. But I would reiterate, it's not that it can't be done. It's just that so so much we we're so often trained to look for the big things and to only pay attention to the big obvious things. And I think, you know, it's why, frankly, we have so many biographies of, you know, someone like Lincoln or someone like Washington. It's so because they're so easy and big. They're also very interesting people, of course, but um, it is it's laborious and you have to be willing to do the laborious thing. Yeah, indeed. and hopefully enjoy it, which I did. Every time I found something about West, I I was just you know skipping up and down. It was so exciting. Very good. And I guess finally, um, I just wanted to know: uh, did the the chronological correspondence did it, it and and other series in the collection did it shape your narrative in any way? I, I know a biography runs roughly chronologically anyway, but um, did the arrangement of the collection? affect the, the story you told in any way? Not the content, but the arrangement. Yeah, that's a really interesting question. I, I would say um, not so much. I, I don't think it shaped how I ended up writing the biography. It did shape my research um, process in the sense that the letter books are all typed the correspondence is overwhelmingly, the correspondence to him is overwhelmingly handwritten. The letter books are mostly his responses, copies of his responses. And it was great to have relief from endless, you know, complicated handwriting to be able to say, okay, today I'm just going to look at the letter books and then go back and forth between them. Like, oh, I know I saw that letter and now I know he responded to that. I mean, in that sense, it does have, a, have an effect. Um, what... In terms of the structure of the biography, I, I think I may have mentioned this um, in a recent talk, but I I originally thought I was going to write the biography backward. I, I thought about starting with his funeral, his death and his funeral, because he's so forgotten, or so much of his story is forgotten today. And I wanted to really hit readers with the 
acknowledge the awareness right away how important he was in his lifetime, that there would be this massive funeral, that Frederick Douglass would send this massive display of flowers, that Frederick Douglass's sons would be pallbearers in Washington, you know, carrying the, I mean, I wanted people to see that right away and be going, oh, and then I decided that's crazy and it'll just disorient people and we'll start at the beginning and we'll go to that um, we'll, we'll take the normal route, but, um, I did think about that. And then I conceded that it was probably better to just use the normal path, but I, yeah. that was a very, that was really a keen desire of mine at the beginning to just say, you people, you know, to like shake the reader by the shoulders right from the start. Very good. Um, it looks like we have some questions from the audience that do, should we get into those? <laughs> Yeah, I was going to say, um, you know, we've got some questions from the audience, and if there are people in the audience who would still like to ask questions, just please remember to submit your questions using the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. Okay, Elizabeth, let's just get this one right out of the way. Did Butler really vote for Jeff Davis for president in 1860? <laughs> and how does that square no. with his being an uncompromising unionist? He did not vote for Jefferson Davis for president. He voted for Jefferson Davis for the Democratic Party's nominee for president because he was a member of the Democratic Party. He was at Charleston in 1860 and the subsequent other conventions of the shattering party uh, that followed. But he initially went to Charleston in the spring of 1860, thinking he would vote for Stephen Douglas, the Democrat, if he thought Stephen Douglas could win the nomination and win the presidency. It became very clear to him early on that Douglas was not going to win the nomination and probably would not win the presidency. And then he started fishing around and had other strategies to try to pick somebody who would have national impact and seemed capable of winning the president. Keep it presidency. Keep in mind that um, Jefferson Davis had not said he was going to secede. He was a Secretary of War. He was a sitting United States Senator. Uh, he had a heroic uh, past, et cetera. And uh, so it was not clear uh, that what was going to happen, nobody knew what was going to happen in the spring of 1860. So um, he he did not vote for Lincoln either, I don't believe, because he voted for, I think he voted for Breckinridge, I think is what I said. But I go through this in rather extensive detail. Um, but it wasn't that he voted for him for president. He voted for him for the Democratic nominee for president. All right. How is it that General Butler supported the underdog? Was he an abolitionist of a particular religious education, or is this something that evolved out of Union Army, the out of being in the Union Army and seeing the horrors on the plantations as they moved south? So essentially, the question is, how does how does Butler become the champion of the underdog throughout his life? I think Butler became the champion of the underdog because he was an underdog. He started his life as an underdog. He started his life in Deerfield, New Hampshire, um, as the son, the youngest son of a widowed poor mother who had five other children to deal with. Uh, and it was unclear that they would survive. And she moved to Lowell, the, married off the older children, moved to uh, Lowell and um, became a boarding house keeper where Butler then lived surrounded by factory laborers and the factory girls of those early Lowell factories. And I think that's where it began. He began by when he earned his, uh, when he passed the bar, became a lawyer, passed the bar. Many of his early cases were helping the Lowell factory girls um, get their pay that had been denied to them for one reason or another. He fought for the 10 hour workday. He started there. Uh, and then as he moved into the war, he became more concerned, obviously, with the experience of the enslaved and Blacks more generally. And as he came out of the war and, you know, we move into a period of economic crisis, he became an ad adamant advocate of the poor and working people generally. But it really ties back to his own youth, um, the small d democratic um, vision of um, key figures in his family, his mother's experience, the Lowell Mill girls, uh, and so on. So that's where it starts. And then it just expands. 
So I'm going to ask a follow up question to our viewers question. The one instance I know you've said where he 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 sort of falls down on on this is that he doesn't stand up or he doesn't he he doesn't advocate on behalf of the Chinese in the 1880s. So where where did that fit into his his kind of um, thoughts about the underdog? Yeah, I this it's it's a little bit mysterious to me, and I think and there are actually other instances. My understanding is I'm I'm learning that there there are some serious questions about his anti-Semitism. Uh, at least during the war, uh, which somebody was pointing out to me, also was fading later on. But initially, he made some very anti-Semitic comments. Somebody else recently asked me, well, how did he feel about Native Americans? And I was thinking, oh, yeah, that's another area where I don't see him making the same kind of commitment. I think to some extent, and this is a little bit off the cuff, but I'm thinking there seems to be a, an important component for him of personal interaction with those who are struggling. And when he sees it in his face, he can, he can embrace it. But he didn't, you know, a lot of the Chinese labor was out West. Certainly Dennis Kearney was coming East and trying to, you know, um, stir up uh, anti-Chinese sentiment and, trying to get Butler on board with him because he knew Butler was powerful. Um, but yeah, it just doesn't seem to have, I don't think that he was rapidly anti-Chinese, but he was not passionately pro-Chinese labor either. And he tried to later on offer a nuance that I thought, nah, I don't know how well that would fly. He, 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 when somebody said, but you know, why don't you care about the Chinese? He said, it's not that I don't, that I'm against the Chinese. What I'm against is forced labor. And the Chinese are being brought in as forced labor. And we don't want forced labor in this country. Um, but I'm not sure how much of a new, you know, whether that was a nuance that really you could make work. So, right. yeah, those are points of disappointment, I would say, you know. Well, I guess nobody's record is perfect. We can, well, we can definitely say that. Admit, you know, I try <laughs> to see as best I can the places where he did, you know, um, not live up to standards that he himself had. You know? mm -hmm. So several uh, several viewers have asked about Butler and being the originator of the contraband policy down at Fort Monroe. So can you address that for, for our viewers in terms of what was it? Did he start it? Yes. The contraband policy, I think, is one of the most important things he did early on in the war, in the war as a whole, to create this policy when these three enslaved men so courageously made their way to Fort Monroe, asked for his protection, and he worked his way through over the course of about 24 hours to this policy where if their owners were to come and swear allegiance to the United States, their Virginia owner, would come and swear allegiance to the United States, then they would be subject to the fugitive slave law and therefore be returned to their owners. I think he knew that wasn't gonna happen and it certainly did not happen. And he decided, well, if they're not gonna do that, then they've left the United States. They're not subject to the fugitive slave law. Therefore they are contraband of war like anything else that can be used against the United States in this rebellion. Uh, and we will take them in and protect them, put them to work and, and so on. Uh, it was a brilliant and, and wily, another a word I know I've used before today, uh, in reference to him, but a brilliant and wily policy. Uh, he originated it in as much as he's the person who established the contraband policy, but I don't want to forget the courage and chutzpah, as we would say in my hometown of New York, of those three enslaved men and the willingness to face danger to, to even go to the fort and you know, run away and go to the fort and ask for that kind of protection. But I think it does push the federal government. It pushes Lincoln the federal government, Congress, uh, towards uh, emancipation. It's not that they weren't thinking about what to do about um, the enslaved people who were surely going to use this war <laughs> as a way to get out of their bondage. Why not? Um, so I think he pushed, it's not that they weren't thinking about it, but this was a, a definitely a, a push in that direction. And the fact that nobody stopped him I mean, we know that Lincoln stopped others down the line where it was 
he felt it was necessary to stop them from like David Hunter and so on from initiating these kinds of policies. Nobody stopped Butler. They just kind of said, um, yeah, whatever, we'll get back to you on that. Um, and he proceeded. And within well, day, I mean, within hours, hundreds and hundreds, you know, slaves are just coming by the hundreds. Well, and and I I've, I know I've read that that for a northern white public, contra confiscating contraband is a different thing than emancipating enslaved people. Right. So right. that that progression of of getting a, a northern public on on board with some of these but you're absolutely right if there's if if those three men hadn't gone to fort monroe there's no contraband policy that's right that's right and all the others that followed which then exactly. pushed further and further i mean it's the same thing as when people say lincoln emancipated the slaves well i mean we have to go back a little bit to slave self-emancipation and the kind of pressure that put on the and, and Butler has been criticized, of course, as I'm sure you know, for not being consistent subsequently around runaway um, enslaved people. And it's true, he doesn't march through, you know, everywhere he goes with his army and emancipate people or even declare them contraband, but it's because the conditions are very different. They're different in New Orleans, they're different in different places. And he knows that and he's trying to work his way in that direction. All right, on a, on a slightly different uh, topic, uh, would you comment on Butler's attitudes towards women, especially given his role as an attorney defending Simon Cameron in 1877 in that breach of promise lawsuit that impugned the reputation of the plaintiff? And perhaps uh, in along with that, you might wanna mention his, his wife and his daughter too, because that's another very striking thing about your book is those relationships he had with the female members of his family. But then there's this breach of promise suit where, where the plaintiff really Really was kind of dragged through the mud. Yes, another area of you know some complexity. I would say he also had some complicated relations with uh, Anna Dickinson, with Victoria Woodhull, where it's not entirely clear what the nature of their relations was, and uh, he got into some scraps with both of them, and uh, and so on. But I would say as an overall um way of understanding his relations with women his feelings about women he was he was an advocate he was surrounded by strong women his mother was a strong woman he had a, a sister who also named charlotte his mother was named charlotte um his sister charlotte died young in childbirth i believe it was in childbirth and I think that affected him. He married a strong woman, his wife, Sarah. He raised a strong daughter, Blanche, who he called Bunty, which for some reason I just love that he called her Bunty. Um, and so he was, and he was very much an advocate of, of uh, woman suffrage as a Congressman. So uh, it's a little bit of a mixed bag. I don't know the, the Simon Cameron story as well as I should that case story as well as I should. There must have been, I imagine, factors that hit a nerve. I, you know, I don't know that he was willing to, or loyalties to Cameron. You know, it's it's hard for me to know without going back and looking at that case more closely. But I would say in general, uh, women thought of him, women ad, women's rights activists and the women in his family, women suffragists thought of him as an advocate and turned to him and, uh, fully expected his support and they got it. All right, so this is a little bit different and I'm, I'm really looking forward to your answer. Which actor do you want to play Butler when your book becomes a screenplay? <laughs> is it gonna become a screenplay? I'm so excited. <laughs> Apparently the uh, audience member knows something that you don't. Oh, but... <laughs> well, call me, call me. I'll have my people talk to your people. Um, oh gosh, who would be a good, I don't know. I wish the. I don't know. That's a. That's a too hard of a question for me to answer. Do you have any ideas, Michelle or Bruce? Tommy Lee Jones, but he already did Thaddeus Stevens, right? Yeah. 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 It would have to be someone who at least can pretend to be kind of short. He was only five foot four. 
So. And you know, and the and the sad thing is, somebody there was a Twitter feed about you know play, somebody playing Butler, and now I can't remember who the actor was that they had. But maybe that's what maybe you need to do that on your social media networks or something of yes. who who would play Butler. <laughs> yes. Well, I have recently been banned from Twitter. I just found oh. out the other day, for no good reason. They won't tell me why, and I have not posted anything offensive. So I no longer can. I can read. I'm not allowed to write. I keep appealing, and uh, hmm. Elon Musk doesn't like me. Well, so we'll we'll have to have this this. You'll have uh, to find out for me. <laughs> well, or or we'll have we'll have to do this this sort of crowdsourcing of who's the actor who plays who plays <laughs> Butler in another in another faction in another oh, way. Yes. You know, uh, Jason Alexander. <laughs> <laughs> he'd be good he kind of looks the part i think he'd be good at it he has the humor and the smarts let's go with jason alexander okay so that that's your answer for today <laughs> perfect oh actually we're, we're getting some oh this is actually perfect uh we're getting some some suggestions dennis franz came up oh yes i've seen that that's the that, one that's yes. the one that was on twitter and other places. i see i see or paul giamatti yeah. Um, Maybe. <laughs> yeah, we've got some good Brendan Gleason. I'm liking Jason Alexander. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, Dennis uh, France makes sense. But is he still alive? I, you know, I don't think he is actually. I but is but I, we will not we will not say definitively because I'm not entirely sure. So um, another another viewer asked if there was anything that surprised you as you were doing your research or writing the book. Anything that's a well, I don't know if it surprised me. It certainly pleased me. I was, I I was hesitant to start this biography for a variety of reasons. Then I committed to to doing the research. Um, then I decided, no, I'm definitely going to do it. It's the right project for me. I was afraid I would really dislike him when I got to know him better, um, and I didn't. I actually really. Um, liked him, I think, without um, being blind to his weaknesses and flaws. But I, and I found as someone who loves words and um, eloquent language and clever humor, I found him just wonderful that way. I mean, some of the quotes um, in the book and in his own writings are just wonderful. I mean, he's just so clever. And, and he also was very self-effacing in, I mean, he was very brazen and brash and egotistical and all those things. And I always point out, I love him as a historical figure and would not have wanted to live with him, just like I didn't want to live with Joseph Holt, but I <laughs> loved living with him in two dimensions. That was great on paper. That's wonderful. Um, similarly, Benjamin Butler, but I did find him very charming and self-effacing and, um, you know, and, and I guess, I guess I really also loved his relationship with his family members, his wife, his children, especially his daughter, his profound um, sense of grief when his son Benjamin died, Ben Israel, unexpectedly as a very young man, his hilarious relations with his grandchildren. I mean, Blanche tells stories about her father, who I think was probably more stern when she, as is often the case, she remembered him as being stern. She talks about him with um, her children as just this hilarious figure. You know, the kinds of conversations he has with his grandchildren are very funny. And, and that, was, that was a lot of fun for me, so. One viewer asks, what do you think was Butler's major contribution to the preservation of the Union during the Civil War? You know, what comes to my mind, and I probably will, maybe I'll regret, I said, I would say the contraband policy, you know, in the sense that what it unleashed down the line, the Union's need for those Black soldiers <laughs> to win that war, you know, that would have been impossible you know, the union might not have won without the contraband policy and the emancipation and the USCT and uh, and so on. So uh, that's what comes first to mind. And I'll probably think of something else as soon as we hang. <laughs> well, but the wonderful thing is there are so many different ways that you could go with that answer that says a lot about Butler and his contributions during the war. Another viewer is 
curious about Butler's relationship professionally and otherwise with Ulysses S. Grant. Mm. Yeah, I, clearly it was not, uh, they were not pals, you know, let's go have a beer together and we see everything the same way. I think Ulysses Grant found Butler frustrating um, because of his command problems, certainly during the final stretch of the war. Um, and there's kind of a funny, when, when Grant is sending Butler off to do his piece of that final campaign in Virginia, Butler seems to have asked Grant so many questions that Grant finally is like, listen, <laughs> I told you what your goal is. You don't need to run everything by me. Just go do what I asked you to do kind of thing. And, and so I think he found him frustrating and was frustrated with his failures and, and was ready to send him packing when the time came after Dutch Gap and, and so on. And, and certainly it's Butler who initiated, I'm sorry, Grant who created that language of bottled up Butler. You know, he was like a, it was like a cork and a bottle at Bermuda hundred and well, um, but I think in his in his memoirs, uh, Grant also says, you know, nobody worked harder for the Union than Butler. And I think he kind of, my sense from reading what he wrote about Butler when he was dying, he himself was dying, is that Grant kind of regretted putting that tag on on Butler's back. At, at, and so because that's what lasted. Again, that's the thing that people remembered and then they forgot everything else. And he made a point in those memoirs of saying, you know, he really, nobody worked harder than he did to save the union and he deserves credit for that. All right, and I'm gonna actually reserve the last question for, for, for us, for myself. Why do you think Butler's life and legacy still matter now? Because the problems he sought to resolve so diligently and at cost to himself, not just himself and his life, but his own memory, persist today. And it's important for us, I think, to look back and realize there was another way. There were other ideas. Reconstruction didn't have to go the way it went. And I think that's part of why he's also been forgotten because or forgotten <laughs> or sidelined because if we look at him we know oh other people had other plans maybe we should have gone that way you know instead of the way that we went as a nation but it means that these there are other ideas you can choose other paths we have a lot of the same problems uh, in a way i'm sure he's wagging his finger at us from beyond the grave i told you you need to stick the landing of union victory um but I also think knowing uh, the kinds of challenges he faced, his persistence, the ideas that he had, the commitment he had, not least to the idea, and I mentioned this in the introduction to the book, that you may not be able to convince people, for example, on issues of race. You may not be able to convince your white neighbor to stop being a racist, but you can change policy so that their racist behavior has to stop by law and over time policies can affect the way people think and behave and he was about changing policies he also was about all the other stuff but he really thought you change the policy and other things have to follow and i, and I think that's maybe good guidance for us we could use some new policies that are a little more just um, and i think he's a good he's a good reminder of that all right well thank you well, we're just about out of time. So um, I want to, to thank Elizabeth for so much for, for speaking with us today about the always fascinating Benjamin F. Butler and your research process. And many thanks to all of you in the audience this afternoon for joining us. We encourage you to visit us online or in person to learn more about the Manuscript Division and to explore the resources of the Library of Congress. And I'm sure I speak for Bruce when I say we're always happy to answer questions through our okay. Ask a Librarian service. And the URL is on the screen and in the chat. So thank you again to Bruce, to Elizabeth, and to all of our viewers, and also our behind the scenes staff who've been helping us so expertly today. So thanks again, Elizabeth. Thank thanks, you. Elizabeth. Really a pleasure.